Chapter 38 Link stared into the trees of the great Hyrule forest, uncertainly. They seemed harmless enough, yet his memory of the Master Sword suggested otherwise. As far as he could see, it looked normal, if perhaps thicker than other forests he'd been through near here. Dabbled sunlight streamed down, illuminating pollen swirling in the air with the breeze. Birds chirped merrily. Were these truly the ominous lost woods spoken of by Zelda in his memory? He glanced up towards the sun. It had only just creeped up over the slopes of Death Mountain from his vantage. He would be able to use it and Death Mountain itself to guide him, though he would likely need to start climbing trees as he got deeper within the forest. Finally, feeling foolish for having hesitated, he stepped forward into the tree line. And it felt like stepping into a forest. Nothing seemed out of the ordinary. The grass was perhaps lusher than it should have been, due to the heavy tree canopy, but it was also the beginning of summer, before the heat and lack of rain would harm most plants. As he walked, his feet crunched on fallen twigs and he stumbled over a protruding tree root. Nothing strange whatsoever. Feeling bolstered, Link pressed on quicker, eager to reach the forest center. By his estimation, it would take all day, and possibly longer. I didn't know you were there with me. When I pulled the Master Sword, he spoke aloud. I didn't really understand the horror in your expression at the time. I think I felt it too, but I was also... confused. He had no idea if Zelda could hear him now. He knew that she watched, but also that she wasn't always fully aware of her surroundings. It pained him to think of her fighting against Ganon without any understanding of what she fought for. So we spoke to her. Maybe she heard him, or maybe not. Maybe it helped her, or maybe not. It felt good to speak such things, regardless. Of course, I didn't know about your prayers then, either. I didn't know of the pressure you felt. I found out about that sometime later, before the champion's ceremony. Link frowned, focusing his mind. It was there, the memory. He could vaguely picture a scene in his head. The king and... Link, now that you have been chosen by the Master Sword, you are part of this now. King Rome, his face solemn. And he wasn't alone. Zelda was there, sitting in a chair and looking as though she wished she could be anywhere else. Rome was behind a desk. Link stood before the desk. I assume that you know of our efforts to unearth the divine beasts and prepare them for Calamity Ganon's eventual return. That has been going on for years now. What you may not know is why that all began. He had heard rumors, of course. They all had. But the rumors were only spoken of in hushed whispers, and never confirmed. Many years ago, a seer prophesied of Calamity Ganon's eventual return. She also spoke of ancient Sheikah relics buried throughout the nation. We didn't believe it at first, but then when the relics began to be unearthed, well, it was a sign that we must begin preparations. How small Zelda had looked in the chair. Fifteen and only two years younger than Link himself, who had just been knighted. The youngest in Hyrule's recorded history. She looked like a child. She sat straight up in her chair, but refused to look at Link, looking somewhere off over his head. Her feet were crossed at her ankles, and she tapped her toe anxiously. My daughter, like you, has an important role to fill in the coming conflict. Her sealing power will be necessary when the Calamity eventually comes again, but despite her pursuit of it since childhood, it has not yet manifested. I hope that your retrieval of the Master Sword is a sign that her power may soon do so. Even then, Link wondered at the way King Rome had brought Zelda into the conference. 
She was obviously uncomfortable and even more so when he spoke about her lack of abilities. She'd drawn into herself, hunched shoulders, hands gripping at her skirt. She didn't at all look like the curious young woman he met in the forest the night he pulled the Master Sword. I tell you this not to cause you fear, my boy. I have faith that you both shall rise to the occasion, as your predecessors did ten thousand years ago. But understand that the burden you now carry on your back will set you apart. You have a far higher calling than any other knight in the land, and I expect you to treat it with the gravitas it deserves. Did the king know how that simple statement would change the way Link approached his interactions with her? He didn't think that he was particularly outgoing prior, but this simple meeting effectively muted him. He stopped making new friends from that moment on, and pulled away from most of his old ones. Did your father place such pressure on you as well? He asked the heir, expecting no response. It's no wonder you resented me at first. I... I forgive you for that, by the way. I don't remember how we eventually became friends, but I remember us being cold to each other. I'm sorry, too, for being absorbed by my own burdens. I was conscious of yours at the beginning, but somewhere along the way, I think I lost sight of them. He paused, looking up at the sunlight streaming down. He wished he could talk to her, as he had in Terrytown. There was so much that he wanted to know. That he needed to know. What happened after the Yiga attack? He thought that he might have been the catalyst to their friendship based on some of the other memories he had. But who opened up first? Who took the first step? He started walking again. This is probably how you felt early on, isn't it? I didn't talk much. I even stopped talking to Mifa. And I've known her since childhood. Daru could still get me to talk, though. He laughed suddenly, and smiled reminiscently. Did you know that I helped Daru control his divine beast out of spite? You'd been trying for so long, and I think I just wanted to do it to see your expression when you found out. We were pretty childish at times, but just know that I felt it too, the burden. I wasn't ready for it any more than you probably felt you were. If I could go back now, I I think I would tell you that. That I was scared too. I still am. Of course, we probably had this conversation a hundred years ago, so you're probably not hearing anything new. Still though, it's good to say it. It's good to be honest. Link fell silent and noticed that the forest had grown silent as well. He stopped walking, frowning as he looked around. The sounds of birds had faded, as had many of the other sounds. Sunlight still streamed down through the gaps in the canopy, but the leaves overhead had grown thicker, leaving fewer openings for the sunlight to break through. He found the silence to be eerie. Was this it, then? Lost Woods? Say, I don't suppose you can tell me what to expect in here, can you? Because my memory conveniently left that out. He paused. You might say that I have a very selective memory. No response. No sound at all. Even his voice seemed quieter, as if the sound was snatched out of the air, right after it left his lips. Ahead, He could see that the forest grew more shadowy. Pursing his lips, he continued on. So it was a dark forest. What did that even matter? If that was the worst of it, then what did he have to be worried about? The forest grew darker. In time, the canopy overhead grew so thick that it blocked out the sun completely leaving the woods around him in shadow. Furthermore, a thin mist rose up from the ground, making it even harder to make things out in the distance. The trees changed too, growing more gnarled with long limbs that hung low. Link's sword hilt caught on the branches more than once. His footfalls were the only sound among the dark trees. Leaves and twigs crunched under him, now sounding too loud in the deep wood. The grass underfoot was dry and brittle as if it hadn't gotten enough rain. 
His path was often impeded by bushes, weeds, and roots that appeared to exist for no other reason than to trip him. Well, I can see why this is called the Lost Woods, he said. Hard to make out what direction I'm even going in. He stopped walking finally, and accepted that he needed to check his surroundings. Looking around, he found a tree that looked promising. It had several low-hanging branches, but seemed tall enough that it likely reached up to the canopy overhead. He walked to it. A twig cracked, and he whirled around, reaching back to his sword. He scanned the forest, but nothing moved, but the shifting, swirling mists. Hello? He said. No response. Is anyone there? Still nothing. His eyes narrowed, trying to pierce the darkness and fog. If it got any darker, though, he would need to light a torch, which would, unfortunately, make it even harder to see in the distance. Finally satisfied that he was alone, he turned around and scanned the tree. What he saw didn't encourage him. Now that he was here, he could see the low-hanging branches just fine, but the handholds after that grew scarce. He wished that he had a length of rope. Climbing would be simple with that. He gazed at other trees around, but saw little that would be helpful. Many of the trunks had grown much thicker, too, with even fewer obvious handholds. This was his best option. Sighing, Link grasped the nearest branch and pulled himself up. He climbed the first ten feet or so this way, using the thickest branches to climb easily. After that, however, the branches grew thinner. He was forced to find grooves in the bark to grip with his fingers, squeezing the trunk with his boost to steady himself. His progress continued, albeit slowly. Eventually, however, he was able to see the leaves of the canopy overhead. The trunk grew thinner, but he found more branches overhead that he was able to use to pull himself higher. Higher and higher he went. How tall were these trees? They didn't even seem that tall from the ground. The canopy seemed so much closer on the ground. He climbed up through a thick spider web, grimacing as the gossamer strands stuck to his face and hair. Yet he continued to climb until finally he reached the leaves. He pushed on further, climbing up through the thick foliage. The darkness lightened, and then suddenly his head was above the ceiling, bathed in light that seemed far too bright. Squinting, Link looked around, finding Death Mountain, and swore out loud. It was in the wrong direction. Somewhere along the way, he had turned south. He reoriented himself so that the mountain was to his right, and took a breath. The climb down in all likelihood would be worse, and he would have to keep in mind which direction he was facing. He began to climb down. The ground was difficult to make out through the mist but he thought that he had a clear enough picture of it. Still, he used a small knife that he had found when fighting the Lizalfos on his travels to cut a gash in the tree to indicate the right direction. He made other similar cuts periodically on his way down to ensure he didn't get turned around as he worked to find new handholds. When he finally reached the ground, he looked up. He couldn't see the canopy overhead, but he could see several of the cuts lower to the ground. It would do. Making one final trio of cuts in the shape of an arrow to indicate his direction of travel, he turned and continued forward. Somehow the forest grew even denser around him. Link was forced to make more cuts in the trees to help keep track of where he'd been, and he greatly wished that he had some other way of keeping track of his direction. Hard to follow a straight line in here, he said. His voice sounded muffled, stifled. Something cracked behind him, and he spun, eyes darting. Nothing was there, however. Nothing moved but the constant shifting mist. Clenching his left hand into a fist, he turned and continued on. The forest grew too dark, and Link was finally forced to light a torch as the day wore on. It was a feeble thing, and one that he had to constantly tend to and relight using resin from the pine trees that he occasionally came across. He grew increasingly certain that he was not alone. Though little else moved, save the occasional animal that he came across, he felt as if eyes were constantly watching him, just out of sight, hiding in the shadows. The hair on the back of his neck prickled as he thought about it, and he gripped his torch tighter, 
making another mark on a tree. It had been a while since he made his way up to the top of the canopy. The trees were growing increasingly more difficult to climb. They were taller now, with fewer branches to climb. Even the bark seemed too difficult to grasp. Another thing worried him as well. When he last climbed to the top and looked back, not only had he veered off course again, but he also didn't seem to be nearly as deep into the forest as he expected. He could see Death Mountain to the east, but it didn't seem nearly as far away as it should have been. Had he looped? Link finally sat down to rest some time later, sighing and looking up towards the shadowy ceiling overhead. He didn't feel much like speaking aloud anymore. There was definitely something eerie about the forest. Its silence didn't feel natural, its darkness even less so. The mist had only grown thicker the further he progressed, at times growing so opaque that Link couldn't see more than a few feet in front of him. He understood now why he recalled having a guide when he traveled through it in the King's retinue. How he wished he had one now. Closing his eyes, he rested his head against the tree. What did Impa think about his disappearance? Did she and the other Sheikah think him dead? What about Cass and Teba, both of whom had been waiting for him to return? Even Rivali had expected him back before too long. The Rito champion would probably assume that he got too scared to return. At least, that's what he would say to anyone who asked. Deep down, though, he might fear that Link somehow perished. Another uncomfortable thought occurred to him. He had certainly thought it before, and it often returned in times such as this. He assumed that the Yika threat had been properly dealt with when he left Impa and Paya in the forest. But did he really know that for sure? There was at least one more Yika, he thought. Dorian was the spy all along. But Dorian had been fighting with them, against the Yiga. He had turned his back on them, right? Link hated the nagging doubt. Had he run off and left Impa and Paya to whatever Yiga remained in the forest? How he wished that he hadn't lost the Sheikah Slate. Something made a noise, and Link's eyes snapped open. Something definitely moved in the shadows. He leapt to his feet and unsheathed his sword, watching the darkness warily. His torch burned fitfully by his feet. He made a hole in the ground with his sword to keep it upright. He watched, waited. But nothing was there. He had seen something, hadn't he? A shadow figure with unnaturally long limbs darting through the branches. A rustling in the leaves. Had it just been the mist forming shapes and playing tricks on his mind? Link continued to scan the shadows until his eyes lighted upon a tree with a familiar marking. Oh no. He hurried forward to inspect the marking, heart sinking further with each step. On the first tree he climbed, he carved a full arrow pointing northwest. But after that, he started making simpler T-shapes in the trunks for convenience. This tree had an arrow. He glanced around, feeling dread seeping into his heart. Yes, he could see it now. The large tree nearby that looked almost like it had a face, due to the rotten section in the middle of the trunk. The way a pair of branches hung down with smaller appendances, like fingers that his sword got caught on. He had, despite several checks along the way, circled all the way back around to where the wood had gotten thicker. He'd been walking for hours. How had he made his way all the way back here, back to this point? It was... Something moved above him. Leaping to the side, Link just barely avoided a pair of long, black appendages that reached down towards him. He followed the long legs up to where they were attached to an enormous spider. It didn't climb down the tree, but instead hung suspended from a long web that extended all the way back up into the canopy overhead. Its abdomen was colored strangely, a mixture of whites and blacks that seemed to form a familiar shape, though it took him a moment to see it amidst the rush of adrenaline. The coloring on its back formed the rough shape of a skull. The spider dropped down to the ground, 
and approached Link, its twin jaws raised toward him. He could see its sharp fangs, which dripped with a dark, viscous fluid. He stepped back farther, pulling out his sword, and wished he'd brought his torch, which still sat a short distance behind him. It was growing dim, anyway. The spider lunged, and he slapped one of its legs aside away with his sword, following up with a thrust towards the spider's face. It reared back, avoiding the thrust. It moved with a speed that belied its size. Skittering around him on the ground with its eight legs, he slowly took a step back, keeping his sword out in front of him, in a defensive stance. The spider advanced and Link swung downwards, striking it with his sword on top of its head. The blow did nothing to harm the spider, the sword's sharp edge merely bouncing off its thick carapace. The spider kept walking forward, and he gasped as some of the hairs on his jaws brushed his arm. He backed up rapidly, trying to get out of its range, but his heel got caught on a protruding root. Link fell and the spider was on top of him, its sharp fangs plunging toward his face. He managed to roll out of the way of the first strike, but the spider pinned him into the ground, its weight on top of him. Grunting with effort, he wrenched his sword arm free and brought the blade around to strike at the spider's side. Again, it deflected harmlessly off its thick skull-patterned back. The spider lunged again, this time catching Link just below his right shoulder with one of his fangs. He cried out as the fiery pain immediately spread through his right side, but then set his jaw against the pain, rotating his sword in his left hand. He thrust and this time caught the spider's underbelly. The spider screeched and leaped off of him, backing away, black ichor oozing from the stab wound. Link rolled over, but found that his right arm did not respond to his commands. It was numb and lifeless. The pain he'd felt earlier was gone as well. He pushed himself up to his knees with his left hand, his back to the spider, but couldn't get to his feet before the spider rushed towards him again. He swept out with his sword, catching and slicing through two of the spider's legs. It fell to the ground, fangs mere inches from Link's calves. Desperately, Link got to his feet, stumbling as his right leg grew weak. The venom, he thought. I have to end this. He turned back to face the spider, which rose laboriously now that it was missing two of its legs. Once it was up, though, it reared up on the rear four legs, hissing. He lunged forward, thrusting his sword at the spider's underbelly, just as it came down on top of him. He felt the weight fall on him as his sword pierced the soft flesh, and he collapsed under the spider. The spider thrashed on top of him and he braced for the pain of another bite in his exposed legs. But none came. Instead, the spider twitched violently, only causing Link's sword to open the wound in its abdomen further, spilling more of its black ichor onto his arms and face. And then finally it stopped. Its leg twitched once, twice more, and then all was still. Groaning in with effort, Link pushed the spider up just enough to roll out from underneath it and lie on the ground next to it, breathing deeply. He couldn't feel his right side at all anymore. The mist overhead swirled and danced, taking various shapes. He saw people in the mists. Faces, some that he recognized and some that he hadn't. Other things, too. Darker shapes, creatures that peered at him, creatures that hated him. Monsters. Gritting his teeth, Link used his sword to push himself to his feet unsteadily. His right leg couldn't support his weight any longer, so he hobbled in a direction at random. Thoughts fuzzy. The venom was spreading now. He could vaguely feel it within his body. The fingers on his left hand tingled. Keep going, he told himself. Don't stop. More faces. More people. He saw his father. He saw Mipha. He saw a young girl with blonde hair holding a model ship in her hands. She had mischievous blue eyes and a wide smile. Don't. You shouldn't be here. Or... Link held out a hand door, but she disappeared with the swirling mists. No, that isn't... Another face. A woman's face. She too had blue eyes. The same eyes as the little girl. Mother, he said, 
voice rasping. The woman's face contorted. Her skin paled and then became ashen. Her face thinned, her high cheekbones protruding. Her eyes sank down into their sockets, growing unfocused. Dead. The face changed further, hair falling out and skin flaking away, revealing a white skull underneath. No! Link reached out, but his hand only found the gnarled trunk of a tree. His hand was empty, the sword dropped somewhere. He couldn't remember. He could barely even feel the rough bark beneath his fingers. He turned and pressed his back to the tree as more faces appeared. Men and women that he didn't know. All dying. Some wasted away in sickness and some grew old and frail. Others burned. He slowly slid down the trunk of the tree until he sat on the ground. He wept. Sobs racked his body as more shadowy figures appeared and then died. He could hear laughing, a high-pitched cackle that reverberated through the trees, coming from all directions at once. And then Zelda was there, dressed in her white dress. She looked down at Link, her expression accusatory, angry, full of hatred and spite, and then she too died, consumed by malice. Then there was Ganon, the pig-like face appearing in the mists, yellow eyes glowing with menace. The great creature opened its maw, and Link saw only blackness and death within. Ganon rushed forward, and he was helpless before the death it brought. Darkness overtook Link, and his head slumped to the side, surrounded by nothing else but a silent forest and swirling mists. Link awoke. He gasped and jerked upright, looking around with wide eyes. All around him the forest was dark and quiet. He breathed quickly, reaching up and touching his body, his chest, his shoulder. He found the scar left by the spider. The wound healed far more quickly than should have been possible, like always, by Mipha's gift to him. He lifted his right arm, flexing his fingers. His fingertips still tingled, Though, whether from a nude feeling or lasting effects of the spider's venom, he didn't know. He lived, though, and that was enough. Groaning softly, Link pushed himself to his feet, leaning on the tree for support. He searched the dark forest for any movement, but he only saw the ever-present mist. Closing his eyes, he tried to force the hallucinations from his mind. His sister, his mother, dead. All dead. Friends, family, neighbors, fellow squires and knights, men and women that looked up to him, trusted him, expected him to save them. Dead. Not all dead, he told himself. Zelda lives. And she still counted on him. Exhaling shakily, he pushed himself away from the tree and stumbled forward. He didn't know which direction he came, but picked the likeliest of directions looking for his fallen sword. He never found it, even as he eventually traced his path back to the spot where the grasses were stained black with the spider's blood. He never found the silvery sword given to him by the Zora. Nor did he find the spider's body. Grimacing, Link turned and continued on into the forest. His arm still felt weak, and he didn't dare climb any trees now. Not now that he knew what awaited him above. So he found his arrow, and turned following its direction. Northwest, deeper into the Lost Woods. Eventually he made another torch from a thick branch and pine sap. It did little to illuminate the gloom, but the warmth and light bolstered him. He pressed forward, following little more than an instinct. He knew that he was hopelessly lost. The trees around him shivered softly, and his torch flickered in the breeze. He looked in the direction the breeze came from, and after a moment continued forward in the direction he'd been walking. Distantly, he heard a wolf howl. You can see me right now. I could use some help, he said to no one in particular. 
Was he speaking to Zelda? Praying to the goddess? Was there any distinction between them anymore? Tree limbs grabbed his hair and face, leaving shallow cuts, but he ignored them. Still, he trekked through the deep forest. Eventually, he slept and rose again, walking some more. Days passed, or maybe weeks, perhaps only hours. In the Lost Woods, time had no meaning. It was always dark. He found his way back to his starting tree again, and again. Each time left him feeling more despair than the last. Could he even find his way back out again if he tried? Where were the guides from his memories? Where were the playful Koroks and the beautiful lush center of the forest? More howls. He didn't know if it was a single wolf or a pack, but it didn't matter. They were tracking him regardless of their number. Occasionally, he thought he could hear them out there. Their paws stirring up leaves and cracking branches. But he didn't know for sure. They likely waited for him to sleep again, before attacking. He found his tree again, but the arrow was wrong. It pointed down towards the ground. Link stared at it numb. He reached out with trembling fingers touching the carving. It was exactly the same, down to lopsided arrow point. How had it changed? What was this place? He clenched his hand into a fist and slammed it into the tree. He gasped at the sudden pain, but it also brought clarity. He wasn't alone in the forest. Something else moved and controlled this place. Zelda claimed that the forest wasn't natural. A trial, he thought as he rubbed his bloodied knuckles. That's what I called it before. I must pass through it to complete my quest. But how? He could wander in this dark wood forever, most likely. Already he didn't know how much time he'd spent in it. At least a day, right? Maybe longer. How many times had he slept? Focus. He needed to focus. Panicking wouldn't help him now. He closed his eyes tightly, listening. Silence surrounded him, save for the quiet whisper of the breeze and the soft rush of his torch. The forest was so still that he could even faintly hear his own heartbeat in his ears. This way, a voice, soft and feminine. Barely there. He felt it drawing him. He allowed it to, following it with barely a second thought. He walked, hardly even hearing his own footsteps any longer. He felt something pulling him deeper into the forest, like a string attached to his heart. It was gentle yet insistent. He turned this way and that, following the voice's quiet directions. As he did so, he became convinced that he was following the right path, even when it occasionally turned him back in the direction he came from before changing directions again. It felt right. The trees around him all still looked the same, dark and foreboding. Yet he was going in the right direction. He soon discovered something else. He followed the breeze. Whenever the quiet tugging on his heart changed directions, the breeze did likewise, blowing the embers of his torch in his new direction of travel. Was this, then, how he was supposed to make his way through the Lost Woods? It seemed to him as though the canopy overhead had begun to lighten suddenly. Link heard another wolf's howl, much closer this time, and he stopped. The howl was followed by a soft grunting noise cracking branches. The sound traveled around him in a circle. Just one wolf. He reached back and placed his shield on his right arm. He wielded his torch in his left hand like a sword. He still had his belt knife, too, but he hoped the torch would suffice to scare the wolf away. He turned to face the direction of the sound and finally caught sight of the wolf's eyes, reflecting the torchlight. He stared into them, and they stared back. Go, he said, and again more firmly. Go! The wolf growled, a deep menacing sound. The eyes rose up, presumably, as he stood up straighter. And then they got higher. And higher. Something stepped out of the shadows and into the torchlight, but it was no wolf. Instead, a large lupine form stood on its hind legs. It had a broad chest and thick arms, 
with long claws at the end of each wolf-like paw. Its face was like that of a wolf, though with a thicker snout and striking yellow eyes. Though this one was covered in shaggy gray fur, rather than the white that he'd seen in the Hebrew mountains. He knew this creature. Teba told him about them. Wolfo. One final trial, then, he thought. Link took a step back from the towering figure, and the wolf dropped back down onto all fours. It growled again. He held the torch out before him. He waited for its attack, which came a few seconds later. It barked and lunged, opening its large mouth wide. He caught the attack with his shield, though it nearly knocked him onto his back. He swept the torch forward and singed the wolf's fur. It yelped and reared back onto its back legs, swiping one of its massive forepaws at Link. It caught him in the side and sent him sprawling. He rolled, pulling his torch up quickly, which had not stopped burning, thankfully. Several spots of grass burned with faint embers. The wolf rushed forward and he swung the torch, halting its advance. It watched the fire warily, and he could see where the fur and flesh had been burned on the left side of its face. He took a step forward, still waving the torch, and the wolf took a step back, growling. That's it. I don't want to fight you, Link said, voice tense. The wolf's eyes flicked to something behind him. Aw, oh, damn, Link thought as he whirled, catching the second wolfo in the jaw with his shield. The first wolfo sprung into action, and he felt its claws rake down his back, shredding his tunic and flesh along with them. He screamed and thrust the torch into the second wolfo's throat, burning it and causing it to cry out, backing away. Link spun and brought his shield down onto the first wolfo's head. It yelped, and its head fell, right as he brought his knee up and slammed it into the wolfo's jaw. He heard the second wolf behind him and spun out of the way, just in time as it bull rushed him, slamming into its companion instead. He lunged forward, thrusting his torch into the mass of grey furred bodies, scorching fur and flesh in turn. The wolfles yelped and parted, backing away. They both watched him warily now, each sporting a number of burns. It looked as though he'd caught one of them in the eye, as its eye was closed and the flesh around was scorched. They began to circle him together, spreading out to surround him. He gritted his teeth, his back burned terribly where the wolfles had torn his flesh. But it would heal. He just needed to survive. Nearby the grass where his torch landed caught fire properly, small orange flames licking the grass next to it and spreading. It gave Link an idea. He swept his torch out across the ground in a wide semicircle, lighting more of the grass on fire around him. It was a dangerous gamble, as he could just as easily be burned, but he hoped that the wolfos wouldn't want to pass through the burning brush to get at him. And indeed, the one in the front of him watched the burning grass warily. The one behind him, however, attacked. It rushed forward snarling, and he spun, catching one of its massive paws with his shield. It enclosed the shield's edge, however, in its claws and pulled him off balance, exposing his torso. It brought its other claws around in an attempt to disembowel him, while it had his shield captive. Link crashed his torso against the other paw, knocking it aside, and then shoved it up into the creature's armpit. It released his shield, and he slammed it against the monster's chest. The wolf hole fell backward and Link leaped upon it, bringing the point of his shield down on its neck, crushing its windpipe. It thrashed, but did not rise again. The other wolf hole attacked, having gotten around the burning grass, it slammed into Link, throwing him off his feet. He rolled through the burning grass, sustaining no burns himself, but lost his torch as it finally snuffed out. The wolfo approached as Link got to his feet, groaning now only illuminated by the feeble flames still flickering on the ground. It watched him with his dark expression, single yellow-green eye filled with rage and hunger. The grass fire died, plunging them both into darkness. Link felt the wolfo slam into him immediately. A mass of fur, muscle, and sharp claws, and teeth. He wrestled with the creature, trying to keep his shield between his neck and the wolfo's teeth. He felt as its claws tore at his skin in other places. Blindly, Link fumbled at his belt. The wolfo barked and snarled, its teeth scrabbling against the shield. It raked its claws against his arm and side, each cut a new flare of pain. His fingers closed around his belt knife. 
The wolf oak grasped his shield with one of its incredibly strong paws and wrenched it back, exposing his neck. It lunged forward, maw open. Link rammed his knife into its remaining eye. The wolf went limp, its teeth closing around his throat, but not biting down. It released one hot breath and died. Link groaned, shoving the dead creature off of him, and stood, holding a hand to his side. He bled from a half-dozen deep cuts. Dangerous, even with Mipha's healing power. It was a lot of blood. And there was no telling if he would be able to heal so quickly now. How long had it been since the giant spider? There were limits to how much he could heal in quick succession. He removed his tattered tunic, and used his bloodied knife to cut it into strips, which he wrapped around his side and back, where the wolfos had done the most damage. He used what was left of it, to wipe his face of sweat and blood, grimacing. Link found his torch on the ground several feet away, its tip still glowing orange slightly. He packed more of the dry grass into its tip, and found a spot where the grass embers still burned, gently coaxing his torch back to life. It eventually caught, and he lifted it above his head, surveying the two dead creatures. Finally, he spat to his side, and looked at his torch. His heart still raced far too strongly to hear the voice anymore, even if it was still speaking and leading him. The torch's embers, however, appeared to be pointing in a specific direction in response to the breeze. He began walking again, just a little bit further now. <laughs>